Hello, and welcome to EdCap's inaugural podcast episode, where we will discuss the latest topics pertaining to higher ed financing. We are New York's designated education debt consumer assistance program. EdCap helps New Yorkers navigate the student loan system. We provide free and unbiased financial guidance along the entire higher education continuum, from paying for school with less debt and comparing financial aid offers to tackling existing student loans. My name is Eric Krauss, and I manage EdCap Stakeholder Engagement. Today, I am joined by the Director and Assistant Director of EdCap, Carolina Rodriguez and Nancy Nierman. Thank you both for joining us for our first podcast episode. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Eric. Before we dive into major student debt topics like Student Loan Forgiveness Plan B, I want to quickly talk about FAFSA. The rollout of the new simplified FAFSA application has been marred by errors and delays. With about 2 million students waiting on aid decisions, this is a big deal. Many colleges have now extended their enrollment deadlines beyond May. First of all, what is going on with the new FAFSA? What is different? And why have there been so many issues? My, that's a big topic to start off. I can say that I do not want to be an incoming college student because uh, that would be a lot of stress not knowing where you stand in terms of your financial aid award letters and having to deal with colleges and universities to make sure you have everything in place. So stepping back a little bit, federal student aid decided to obviously redo FAFSA, the application, and they've streamlined it. And while it is great to have a more simplified version to make sure that more students apply for FAFSA and financial aid as expected. You're dealing with a big system, a new application that requires a lot of effort uh, to make it right to deploy. So from the get-go, we saw that the FAFSA was not going to be ready in October, which is traditionally when it becomes available. So that got pushed back and unfortunately there have been a lot of technical issues. So in general, uh, I know that it, it is working right now with some glitches. And uh, again, I want to recognize that the intent there was the right intent to make it more simplified and better for more students to apply. However, the deployment has, has not worked out as expected and has led to a lot of delays at this point. Yeah, how have we seen colleges respond to these delays and issues? Um, have they tried to alleviate any of these issues? What has their response been? Yeah, so a lot of colleges, as you mentioned, have pushed back uh, the date that they have to, that students have to accept um, their college acceptance offer, so to speak. I think we want to keep in mind that this is also the first time these colleges and universities are getting this version of the FAFSA. So they are also kind of behind because they haven't had experience in responding to the new information that they're getting from, uh, from FAFSA, federal student aid. However, a lot of colleges have... Uh, acted accordingly and are moving forward in creating their own systems to assess financial need. So we highly encourage people to be in communication with their financial aid offices of the prospective colleges that they're thinking of attending because the school or university may have more information and more guidance at this point. Okay. Are you saying some colleges are actually providing aid award letters ahead of getting FAFSA data or trying to, you know, get ahead of it in that way in some form? Correct. I think some colleges may use other profile and other information that they have on record because remember, each college is going to be different. Obviously, they will wait for, for a FAFSA for an official uh, packet, but they are working with the information that they have. And at times, students will be required to provide additional documentation to the colleges and universities, and they use that information. Got it. So these are like pre preliminary award guidance. letters. Guidance. They're giving guidance. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay. Um, given all of these changes and kind of the big questions that are still out there as the technical issues kind of continue to be uncovered, what should students and their families know right now and what do they need to do? Nancy, do you want to take a stab at that? So, um, Obviously, uh, there is still time uh, since the deadlines have been extended to file the FAFSA. One of the things that you should know about this um, new version of FAFSA is that the, the parents uh, must participate and they must file taxes. So this has been a change uh, from previous iterations of FAFSA. 
Um, so if you're a parent of somebody that's about to go to school and you have not filed your 2022 taxes, you need to make sure that you do that so that your child is going to be able to get aid going forward. So that's like, that's one of the key things. Um, and the other is to, I, I, I'm just reiterating what, what Carolina was saying earlier is to be in communication with your financial aid offices to see if they can assist you and maybe give you, um, some preliminary guidance as to what the aid is going to be. So you're not going to be completely in the dark about how you're going to finance school. Gotcha. And do we have any sort of pulse check today when we can expect financial aid award letters to go out? I think my understanding is that some of those award letters are going out and um, you actually have to wait for you to get that official um, notice, your aid summary from federal student aid. Um, we know that there were a lot of issues and some people may need to go back and fix their FAFSA. I think those summary reports are going out. So there's again, light at the end of the tunnel. There's other people that are gonna have to wait a little bit more to fix those. I also wanna point out that um, aside from FAFSA, you wanna take a look at any state applications because you want to make sure that especially if you're going um, to college in your home state you don't want to miss any state deadlines uh, as you're trying to resolve your FAFSA issue and as Nancy mentioned one of the biggest changes that this new FAFSA application has is that parents are going to have to be involved parents will have to file taxes uh, if you're married separated there's different rules that we're not going to go into but be aware of all this rules to make sure that you're ready to go um, and then address any glitches uh, that come your way. Gotcha. All right, moving on to a big topic on a lot of people's minds, student loan forgiveness. So we know the Biden administration's Department of Education is to continuing to go through the negotiated rulemaking process, otherwise known as NEGREG, for the so-called student loan forgiveness plan B, uh, after the court struck down broad-based relief last year. Uh, can you give us an update on where things are now uh, and what borrowers can expect in terms of this potential new relief? I'll start off and again, Nancy can feel free to chime in. So one thing I want to be clear is that we do not foresee having broad-based cancellation as the Biden and Harris administration tried to do, which was struck by the Supreme Court. I think we often get bars holding off to hope and which great, you can hold on uh, on hope, but it's probably not going to happen, meaning we're not just going to get like ten to 20,000 across the board. The plan B is more targeted, more narrow, and they are focusing on people who may be experiencing a hardship, whether that be financial hardship, uh, disability-based hardship, and there's other programs in place that address some of those issues already that are in existence. Uh, but again, this is if it moves forward with the negotiated rulemaking process, we may see it as early as like in the summer. Um, the administration is going to try to act fast and and try to provide the relief almost automatically. There may be some application for some individuals, but again, the administration is trying to figure out what information do we hold that we have access to that we can then uh, act upon without having to, people to apply because when there's an application requirement, it just delays the process. Takeaway, we do not expect broad-based cancellation. There may be some cancellation discharge for specific populations that uh, may be at more risk of a delinquency default. And I think that in addition to the hardship uh, um, options, they are also talking about potentially um, looking at the the length of time that people have had debt. So if they've had their debt for, for 20 years or more, that may be some kind of automatic trigger, or if their current balance is, is larger than what it was when it when they started out, that might be some kind of trigger as well. Um, but I also think that you have to keep in mind with this that in addition to the fact that, you know, there's going to be an effort to maybe roll this out relatively quickly, that's probably an anticipation that there's going to be legal challenges to this, like there was with the with the previous. Um, regardless of the fact that it's different, there is probably legal challenges waiting in the wings. And we don't know when that might happen or what shape that might take or what kind of impediment that might prove to be for implementing whatever regulations are put into place. Right. Is there any additional information that borrowers may need to provide for this um, Plan B forgiveness? Um, will they have to apply for it um, or any other kind of processes they may need to go through or will it be more automatic? 
I think it's going to be automatic, but we do have one tip, and that is you must make sure that your information is updated with federal student aid. That is the federal government's national database, and it has all your loan information. And the reason why you want to make sure that you are in tune and your information is updated because you want to be part of that, any forgiveness, right? Um, we're not going to go into, like, make sure that you have a, an account in good standing. That may not be required. They're looking at a hard but at minimum you should have updated contact information on studentaid.gov you don't want to miss a magical email or a request or an opportunity that you may benefit from and, and then there, keep a pulse there's a lot and there's a lot of unanswered questions about this as well yeah. you know there's the policy and then there's implementation and so we've seen this in the past the policy is one thing implementation is a whole other boy, you know ball of wax um so we have to you know once the the rules come out we have to read the details and see right. how the implementation how implementation is going to work out gotcha yeah certainly more to come on this and we'll be sure to discuss it as it uh, develops but i i, I would also want to add to everybody um it's great that all of this is going on um, but don't lose focus on the programs that are available now, which I know we're going to get into yeah. in a little bit. Um, but there are plenty of other options that are there and are available right now. Um, so don't get too stuck on sure. forgiveness plan B, because there may be things that will help you without having to rely on that. Yeah, speaking of, there, there's something coming even sooner in terms of potentially getting forgiveness or maximizing your forgiveness, which would be the IDR account adjustment otherwise known as the one-time payment count adjustment, which comes to an end on April 30th, 2024. For a lot of borrowers, it's not really clear what this all means. Um, can you help break it down in simpler terms for everyone? So the IDR account adjustment um, is a one-time account revision that at its core is gonna basically allow borrowers to accumulate credit, retroactive credit, towards two very uh, significant forgiveness programs. Um, and it will, will be based on a relaxed set of rules on this one-off type of assessment of their loans. So um, the two programs that it benefits are something called IDR forgiveness. So if you're in a repayment plan that's based on your income, and there are four of these plans, if you're in the SAVE plan, PAYE, IBR, or ICR, and you're making required payments over anywhere between 10 and 25 years, you are ultimately eligible to have your loans forgiven if you've made all those required payments. Um, for that particular program, there are no employment requirements. You just have to be in those plans. Um, the other big program is called Public Service Loan Forgiveness, where you are eligible to get your, your, your loans forgiven after 10 years of qualifying payments, but there is an employment component of that. You must be working at least 30 hours a week for a qualifying employer, which would be a nonprofit or government. So what the IDR account adjustment is doing is it's going to look back, it's going to take a look at your loans, um, and it's going to look back pretty much as far back as your loans go, although not earlier than July of 1994, because that's when the first income-driven repayment plan um, was established. Uh, but that's still pretty far back. Um, and it's going to give you credit towards forgiveness, not based on whether you not made a payment, but based on your repayment status. And repayment status just meant were you at the time required to make a payment. So if you were in repayment, you might have been required to make a payment, but under the IDR account adjustment, you would get credit even if you didn't make that payment. Um, were you in a forbearance or a deferment? In, in um, you know, prior to the IDR account adjustment, you generally would not get credit for periods that you were in forbearance or many periods in, de in deferment. Um, but in this instance, many of those periods being in a forbearance or deferment are going to count towards um, towards these forgiveness programs. And it's basically in one fell swoop going to bring people closer to the point where they may be able to eliminate their debt, or in some cases it will, will get people to the point where they're actually eligible to discharge the debt right now. Um, the key things uh, to know about the IDR account adjustment is that you must have direct loans. So uh, that's a loan program or a loan type. You must have the name direct in the type of loan that you would look at your either your um, your servicer account or your federal student aid account. You must see the name direct in your loan. It could be a direct 
unsubsidized loan, a direct subsidized loan, direct consolidated loan. We'll talk about Parent PLUS loans in a minute. Um, and, uh, and you will get the benefit of the IDR account adjustment. You don't necessarily have to take any action. However, if you have some of these older loan programs, things like FELP or Perkins or HEAL loans, those need to be consolidated to convert them into direct loans by April 30th. And that is the, the key part of the deadline. You just need to file a consolidation application. The consolidation doesn't have to be completed. You just have to file the application by, by April 30th, and you will get the full benefit of the IDR account adjustment as it applies to IDR forgiveness or public service loan forgiveness. Can I just add, um, because I know that's a lot of information and I often hear bars say like, well, I have Nelnet, I have Mohila, do my loans qualify? And I think there's a lot of confusion, rightfully so. We have a very complicated system. I want to emphasize what Nancy said, that if you want to take advantage of the IDR account adjustment, and I'm even going to say, if you want to have the ability to benefit from other future relief, mm -hmm. your yeah. odds are way better if your loans are direct. Direct is a loan type. So throughout the history of our lending system, there have been different programs. So for older borrowers, uh, pre-2011, there were FELP loans, right? And there were some Perkins loans that ended in 2017, I believe. So if you want to, again, increase your odds at benefiting from the current relief and prospective relief, you want to make sure your loans are direct. The reason why you want them to be direct, because that means that the federal government is your direct lender. So if they are your direct lender, then they have the ability to discharge or forgive your loans. A great case, case example of this and why people missed out, during the payment pause, some bars did not benefit from having their payment suspended because they were not direct loans, meaning the federal government could not suspend the payments for the three plus years because again, they were not the owners. It was a third party lender being the owner, or in the case of Perkins, it was the mm -hmm. higher education institution. So if nothing else from this conversation, you wanna make sure you have direct loans, it would be to your advantage to make sure that you consolidate if you need to by April 30th. And I just wanna put in perspective, the reason that the IDR account ad adjustment is in existence, as was the PSLF waiver before it, is these are not new programs. You know, the IDR forgiveness program has been around since the mid-1990s. PSLF has been around since 2007. But they were very poorly managed administratively and, and made it virtually impossible for anybody to actually take advantage of them. So prior to these fixes that have been applied, um, there were, I, I think, maybe 7,000 people that had gotten PSLF, and there is an estimated 2 million people that are eligible for this program. Uh, since these fixes have been put in place, and again, they're fixes. This is not a brand new forgiveness program, which sometimes gets misconstrued in the way the press interprets it. Um, but these fixes, since these fixes have been in place, um, over, I think, close to 2 million borrowers have been able to get forgiveness as a result of just the IDR account adjustment. There is other forgiveness that's out there right. that's increased that number overall. Um, but that just shows you with just basically saying, okay, we've recognized that we've made a mistake here and we need to give the benefit of the, the doubt to the borrower and, and give them credit for being in this debt for many, many years and doing what they thought was right. Um, and they're getting, they're getting their credit now. So it's a good thing. Um, it's and, a great thing. <laughs> and, and, and the other thing that I do want to add, um, because I don't want to um, not talk about this, is just a, a little issue about Parent PLUS borrowers. So we talked about the fact that you must have direct loans in order to benefit from the IDR account adjustment. Parent PLUS borrowers, if you have direct Parent PLUS loans, you will benefit from the IDR account adjustment, but you need to be careful consolidating those loans. Um, and that's probably too big a topic to go into right now. Um, but if you are considering consolidating your loans for the purposes of the IDR account adjustment, and they are Parent PLUS loans, you want to reach out um, for some advice before you, you do that. Because there are special considerations uh, that surround Parent PLUS loans. Got it. Um, one other topic related to this, what about borrowers, multiple federal student loans, can they also benefit from the IDR account adjustment? 
I can say a word about that. Not a lot of people know this and it, you won't find it in the media. I think it's 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 the hidden benefit that I think it's even more impactful uh, for some borrowers who have multiple loans. So basically under the IDR account adjustment for people who are consolidating or even for people who have direct loans and technically do not need to consolidate, if you consolidate all your loans and let's say you went to undergrad, you enter repayment for a period and then years later, you went to graduate school and you have more recent graduate loans technically if you're pursuing a forgiveness program you must meet the payment requirements on each individual loan right so if you started repaying your undergrad loans earlier and then uh, your grad more recently you would be on two different uh, forgiveness tracks per se Right now, under the IDR account adjustment, if you consolidate those loans together, you will get the highest payment count applied to your entire consolidated balance. So it, what is happening through the IDR account adjustment is people are getting forgiveness on their entire loan balance uh, because they've gone through the consolidation. Uh, again, if you have direct loans with different repayment histories, there is if there was a time to consolidate, it is this month before the April deadline because then you're going to get the highest payment count applied to your entire consolidation. And by the way, the easiest way to do a consolidation is online through your federal student aid account at studentaid.gov. Um, you'd probably be surprised that it's actually not as complicated a process as it sounds, but allow yourself about a half an hour to get through the application and make sure that you're you're reading everything. Um, again, you just have to submit the application by April 30th in order to qualify. Yeah, and I, I'm glad you brought that up because I think sometimes people confuse where to consolidate and also confusing consolidation with refinancing yeah and i think just to make clear, the, those are right? two separate things and you want to stay away from refinancing your federal loans in part because refinancing refers when you go out into the general market and take out a private loan to pay off your federal loans do not do that i mean I maybe once in my entire career I have to I've had had to advise or say hey you might want to consider this um, you lose a lot of benefits by leaving the federal system and you cannot bring private loans into f the federal system right like you could always get a private loan to pay off your federal but you cannot do the reverse uh consolidation for federal loans as nancy mentioned you're doing it through studentaid.gov you have your own account there's even a demo if you don't want to start the application you can start the application yeah. and go all the way through the submission and then pause you can save the application so unlike before where you had to do the consolidation yeah. in one sitting now you can save it and if you get stuck on a question take a look at it again literally you can consolidate without losing um anything major if you do it by april um 30th, 30th i would say take a look at that especially if you have again multiple loans um that you might benefit from bringing them all together definitely so moving on the biden administration has taken a lot of steps to improve the student loan system including the program we just discussed along with fixes to public service loan forgiveness and the creation of a new, more affordable income-driven repayment plan called SAVE, which protects more discretionary income, prevents runaway interest from accumulating, discharges student loans in as little as 10 years for some borrowers with small loans, and will cut loan payments in half for undergraduate loans this summer. Uh, a lot going on here. All that being said, Republicans have tried to repeal many of the administration's relief programs and we're now in an election year. What do you foresee happening to these programs if Republicans win back the White House later this year? Yeah, that's that's a, a big question that I think uh, we always hesitate to answer because we don't have a, a magic ball that determines the future, we can foresee it. Um, before I dive in into my own opinion on this situation, I wanna again step back and provide some perspective. Uh, we are getting this question a lot. What if, what if, like every other session people are asking us, uh, from a borrower perspective, enrolled in the best repayment plan that you can right now, SAVE is probably, S-A-V-E is probably going to be the best option for a lot of you. 
do you right now and follow the rules. Do not focus too much on the what ifs because we will deal with the what ifs when they come. And honestly, there will be no other alternative. Like I wouldn't advise a client not to enroll, mm -hmm. for example, and save just out of the fear that it might go away. Well, then if that goes away, then we'll have to deal with the reality then. If anything, I would say enroll and take advantage so this so there's a message that these programs are popular. For example, I believe there are seven million borrowers now enroll in SAVE. Half of them are getting a zero required payment, and that really highlights how impactful this 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 uh, repayment plan is, right? So now, what would happen if another administration came in? Obviously, there are changes, and aside from potentially like there being rule changes, I want to focus on the implementation impact, right? As Nancy mentioned, you could have the best rules or you could have rules. It all depends on how they're implemented, right? So we could foresee that if there is a less friendly administration um, next year in 2025, uh, there will be a slowdown in the implementation of the current programs across the board, right? Uh, we will not be expecting, for example, to have more generous, flexible rules mm -hmm. like we have under the IDR account adjustment and like we had under the public service loan forgiveness waiver. We could foresee that that would be the case where, well, we're just not going to get all this flexibility, but we all also could see a hindrance in the implementation of the current programs as they are. Uh, we could also expect that there's not going to be more uh, potentially favorable um, options for borrowers or improvement to the current program, so to speak. Uh, but again, my takeaway is act according to the current rules and available programs. We'll worry about the future and what that what that means for borrowers. Nancy, I don't know if there's anything you want to add on that heavy topic. <laughs> <laughs> it is a heavy topic. And, and, you know, as we get closer to the election, more and more people are starting to ask about it, as you said. Um, but I know I agree with everything that you say. I, I, you can't you can't make decisions based on on a situation that we don't know exists yet. Um, and the one thing about these, at least the income driven repayment plan programs, is that they were put in place originally by Congress. Um, and I think it would be a, a fairly heavy lift to completely undo it. I, I don't know that I foresee that happening. Yeah. Um, but I, I, you know, to, yes, of course, they can make it. They're not going to, if we have a, a, a Republican administration, they're probably not going to be offering more beneficial options than what we already have. Um, we'll have to wait and see whether or not they have the gumption to start taking away what a lot of people have already been able to, you know, um, take advantage of right now. And I should say a, a common question goes around the public service loan forgiveness program because mm -hmm. it's right. it's a program that people work 10 years towards and like their fear is like, I'm going into the public sector just to tackle my dad. Am I going to be left hanging year five? No, out of all the programs, that's probably the one that I'm most comfortable in saying like you should be okay in part because that program is in statute. So yeah. in order for that to be changed, it has to go through Congress. And let's not forget, like Congress is not doing much right now, right? political divisions, what have you. Uh, it's been years since the Higher Education author has been reauthorized. The Higher Education Act here has been reauthorized. Um, so it would, t it would be an extremely heavy lift uh, for Congress to say, now I'm going to target public service loan forgiveness. And given the popularity and the fact that it is now finally working, I could see an uproar where very few people are going to be like, let's get rid of this major program. Which, by the way, was started during the Bush administration. So yes. <laughs> let's just not forget yes. who started the public service loan forgiveness program, which is a key, key program. I mean, when you think about it, if if we want to ensure that we have teachers and nurses and social workers, um, legal aid offices going forward, that program needs to stay in right. place intact. For a while, PSLF wasn't really working. Can borrowers expect the fixes that have been implemented to be long lasting and more or less permanent? regardless of kind of the political lens? Well, they certainly, the fixes that have been implemented between the waiver and the IDR account adjustment will get people caught up to where they should be now. Right. So um, so for sure, people that maybe should have been eligible for forgiveness five years ago um, 
will get it now as a result of these the, these changes, and people will get closer to eliminating their debt. Now, they just implemented a new set of rules, um, permanent rules for, for PSLF, things like allowing you to consolidate and not lose credit for... Um, and not lose retroactive credit, which is something that had happened in the past. Um, whether those things could be unwound again in the future, I don't know. I, 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 it's not my anticipation that that would happen. Um, I suppose they could tweak the rules, um, but certainly everybody will be everybody will be caught up to where they need to be right now. And, and I want to emphasize as someone who benefited from public service loan forgiveness, and I'm proud to have benefited. I think it's 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 a great program, and people should really have faith in it. Um, the one of the biggest issues that borrowers had borrowers from my time was that there was no really uh, ability to track your progress mm. towards this program, and now we have it. Right, like there's literally a form called the Public Service Loan Forgiveness Employment Certification Form available. There's actually a tool that you can fill it out online and you can request your employer to verify your employment electronically, right? There's also the PDF version. So we've come a long way on something so basic that again, when PSLF was established, the implementation got kicked down the line. And a lot of borrowers made the assumption that I just worked for 10 years in a nonprofit government and then somehow I raised my hand and then my loans disappear. And that was not the case. There were very specific requirements like you needed to have direct loans. So all those with older loans like Phelps or Perkins needed to have consolidated. I mean, there were just so many things um, that got in the way of people actually accessing the program. That's why the the IDR account adjustment waiver, PSLF waiver, allow for all those fixes. Uh, but now we have a way to track it, and I would be surprised if we yeah. went backwards on, on, on something so basic yeah. of like there's a way for you to track your progress. And by the way, um, they are now talking about uh, implementing a or, or, or providing a tracker for the IDR forgiveness program as well, which is in my mind, even bigger than, than PSLF, uh, it affects probably more people. And we've never had any transparency um, on that program prior to the IDR account adjustment. So now people will know later this year, um, people are going to get notified by the government and they're going to be told exactly where they stand with, with, in terms of how many qualifying payments they have towards IDR forgiveness. So for those that have large loan balances but don't have the kind of employment requirements that make them eligible for PSLF, they'll know how much longer they're going to need to pay. And I think that that's just a game changer. Um, very excited to, to, to see that so people know where they stand and they can plan accordingly. Definitely. Uh, looking more kind of on the legal side of things, um, 11 Republican states have sued the Biden administration to block the new save plan, uh, the new income driven repayment plan. What do you make of it? Um, could you see the same fate that broad based cancellation met last year uh, when it was ultimately blocked by the Supreme Court? Could, could we see that happening again here with save potentially? So I'm not going to go into like, yes, they're going to win or no, they're not going to win. But I do want to mention the states because I'm going to do a little note. Kansas, Alabama, Alaska, Idaho, Iowa, Louisiana, Montana, Nebraska, and I believe South Carolina. Um, I hopefully got all the 11 states. Um, here's the thing about the latest challenge. And I want, I want to preface it by saying that even in... In the Biden-Harris cancellation, it went up to the Supreme Court. There is this issue of standing. Does the party bringing the lawsuit have standing, meaning are they going to be harmed if this goes through? And the reason why I mention those states is because all those states have student loan borrowers. And uh, for everyone in general, for you to understand what the arguments they're making. These states are saying that allowing save uh, obviously, it cedes the Biden administration's rights to be able to implement this X, Y, similar arguments as the previous Supreme Court decision. But they are saying that they're going to be harmed because bars are going to be getting forgiveness under the safe plan uh, and they're not going to be able to tax that amount. OK, and they're not going to be able to tax that amount until 2025 because um during COVID, there was a rule that went into effect that 
the federal government was not going to tax uh, income-driven repayment forgiveness, for example, forgiveness in general, any kind of any kind of educational forgiveness, debt, forgiveness up yeah. until 2025. So, number one argument that they say that they're going to be harmed is that, hey, well, we're not going to be able to tax bars who are getting forgiveness under the Safe Plan at least until 2025. That's one argument. The second argument they're making is like, by the safe plan giving these people forgiveness, it's gonna incentivize our teachers or public servants to seek private employment. I'm sorry. If those are your arguments and you're saying that that's how you as a state is gonna be harmed, I will counter that, right? And if we focus on public service loan forgiveness and the safe forgiveness component, under SAVE, if you originally took out $12,000, you get your loans forgiven, discharged after being in repayment for 10 years. For public service loan forgiveness, you must work and repay your loans for 10 years. So that is not jiving, right? So you're saying you're going to be harmed because people are not going to follow through the public service loan forgiveness. Also, most teachers, if you require a license, a bachelor's, I guarantee you, you took out more than 12,000 in student loans. So again, I mentioned those states because I think there's a lot of power by bars that you should raise your voices. Your attorney generals are using their time and resources to say that they have standing because they cannot tax you at the state level if you get forgiveness and because they cannot force you to stay in low paying jobs. And the last tidbit, without getting too passionate about this, is the very fact that for a lot of our teachers, uh, SAVE is the only way that they're going to be able to get public service loan forgiveness because the other income-driven repayment plans were just not affordable. And not just teachers. Not there just are, teachers, it's, the whole it's public the whole sector. gamut of public service. And yeah. government, yeah. employees. Yeah. So... To highlight that, again, the only reason why people are actually going to be able to get public service loan forgiveness is because they can find a truly affordable payment right. under SAVE, and they couldn't before. And let's not go into inflation. Let's not go into stagnant wages. So all these arguments that the states are bringing, I'm sorry to say, it's it's they're not true arguments whether it moves forward from a legal perspective because we know what's happening when it reaches supreme court levels um, and not very friendly uh, court systems that's another story but again i i mentioned those states because i encourage borrowers to really raise your voices and say um, that you have a stake in this and it's not that you're going to be harmed by safe yeah. more to come on this one for sure yes stay tuned yes more to more to come <laughs> Uh, moving on, uh, I'm going to leave this pretty open-ended here, but what is going on with the uh, current loan servicing environment? We've seen a lot of stuff in the news, so if you could just kind of uh, give us some clarity on what's going on and, and what people should expect from their loan servicers. So, yes, there is a, there, I mean, we've seen a sea change um, over the last, I'd say, 18 months to two years. Um, when I first started working in the student loan space, I think there were 10 plus servicers just doing uh, direct loans. Um, that's now down to four. Um, and in addition to that, you've got a couple of servicers, Navient and AES, um, that used to do, well, Navient, at least in the case of Navient, they used to be one of the main direct loan servicers. They got out of that business by getting rid of their um, direct loan portfolio last year. Um, they were left with just currently the, some of the FELP loans, the old commercial FELP loans, and and federal, uh, private student loans. And they've announced that they're going to um, basically farm those out for servicing. They no longer wish to service or those service those loans. Um, there is also, I mean, there's a couple things going on in terms of the actual servicer functions going forward. There's something called the, uh, and I always have to, it's the Unified Servicing and Data Solutions, which I'm just going to refer to as USDS because I can never remember what the <laughs> acronym stands for. Also known as the Next Gen Project. <laughs> Next Gen Project, right. Um, which is a significant overhaul of the student loan servicing um process, which is kind of something that's more happening behind the scenes. Um, in fact, I think, uh, you know, Mohila just sent out a notification that um, 
that they're going to be doing some work behind the scenes for public service loan uh, forgiveness employment certification uh, forms. Bottom line is the, the entire U.S. Uh, DS process is supposed to streamline the servicing process for bars and make it sort of a cohesive process so that it doesn't matter whether your loans are at Nelnet or whether they're at Mohila or whether you're, they're at Advantage, you're going to get the same servicing experience. And one of the main things that's going to come out of this is that people who are pursuing some of these specialty programs like public service loan forgiveness or total and permanent di disability discharge are not going to have to have their loans at a particular servicer to experiencing that. So right now, if you're you're pursuing PSLF, you would have to have your loans at Mohila. And there's different ways to get them there, which I'm not going to go into. But ultimately, it was Mohila that was the only servicer that was going to be able to give you a qualifying payment count, give you a tracker. Um, there's this three month period where they're going to be doing some stuff behind the scenes between May and July. After that, it appears that, um, and well, TBD and, and more to come on this, that you will be able to um, pursue some of these specialty programs and not have to switch your servicer if you don't want to do that, which I think is going to be a big relief to a lot of people because a lot of things happen sometimes in, in transitioning from a servicer to, to the next. There are administrative problems, um, errors. If you can eliminate uh, and do away with that, that's going to be a, a really good thing. For, for people and not and also will cut back on delaying the process frankly um, so that's that's one of the biggest kind of benefits of what they're doing behind the scenes a lot of it also is just technical which you know um, we're not gonna we're not gonna comment on and, that and I want to point out because I think this is another like bar misunderstanding and that I had alluded to um, earlier is your student loan servicer is contracted by the Department of Education to manage your loans they're the ones sending yeah. you your monthly bill but again for most bars especially if you have direct loans your lender is the Department of Education and regardless of the servicer you have Nelnet, Mohila, Ed Financial, uh, Advantage, they follow the same rules. So you technically have access to the same programs and same repayment plans regardless of the servicer you have. So um, as Nancy mentioned, there are obviously a lot of transitions that should be good, but similar to FAFSA, we'll see how deployment and implementation goes. You can actually start seeing those changes on the servicer website. Their domain name may now have .studenta.gov attached, right? Um, but I know we're probably going to tackle or focus a little bit more on what has happened with return to repayment yeah. and servicer issues. Um, but yeah, stay tuned. Yeah. I, I, well, I, before we go on to that particular uh, part of the question, um, I just also want to mention as part of the uh, USDS process, there's probably going to be more information available to you on your federal student aid account at studentaid.gov. And just to be clear, federal student aid is an office of the Department of Education. So that is essentially the government's website. Um, studentaid.gov is the warehousing of all of your federal student loan information. So if you have loans at multiple servicers, you're going to be able to see everything on your federal student aid account. So if you haven't done it yet, you want to go to studentaid.gov and make sure that you um, create an ID for yourself because you're, there's probably going to be more information that you're going to be able to monitor on that site going forward in addition to your servicer accounts. And you might already have an ID if you apply for FAFSA right. recently. Sometimes you just have to reset it. Um, I think there's two main websites that we always recommend borrowers to have access to and monitor. That is federal student aid, studentaid.gov and their servicer website. Like if, if we're counseling clients, we must go and see their information on studentaid.gov because as Nancy mentioned, someone could have multiple loans and even two or more servicers. So if we want to get the full picture, if you want to know what exists when it comes to your federal loan debt, you want to go to studentaid.gov because that's where everything will be at and you're not going to miss a loan per se. But just federal debt. So if, you have, if, you, have no private, private. if you have private loans, you're not going to see those on that site. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're seeing some future into how the loan services are going to handle things differently with the next gen. How has uh, the return to repayment been? Um, and are there any key things borrowers need to know right now as they begin repaying their loans? Some people are just now entering repayment with the on-ramp. Um, how has that transition been? So the on-ramp was there for a reason. 
Now we know what the reason was. Um, the on-ramp was a is, a is a grace period that's allowing people to skip payments up until September of this year um, as they transition from three and a half years of not having to make a payment into repayment. Um, it's been challenging, as a lot of people thought that it might be. There were, at, certainly in the early months, there were a lot of technical problems, so people weren't notified um, in time, uh, they weren't given enough advance notice that uh, that a bill was going to be coming due. Um, there was a lot of uh, miscalculation of IDR um, payments, particularly in the SAVE plan as we, tra as we transitioned from the old revised pay-as-you-earn plan into SAVE. Um, I'd say it's getting better. It's not perfect for sure, but it's getting better. And um, w one of the things um, for anybody that's consolidating uh, or that has recently consolidated, when you do a consolidation application, you also submit a, a payment plan request at, at the time that you're doing that application. And most people will apply for an IDR application during consolidation. What we have seen is a, um, a delay in processing the IDR applications as part of those consolidations, and even in just filing an, a, a standalone IDR application. So if you're waiting to be enrolled in an income-driven repayment plan, um, you want to make sure, and, and you're pursuing some kind of forgiveness program where you have to be in that plan in order to get the credit, you want to make sure that you're looking at your servicer account to see what kind of repayment plan you're in. So you want to see the name of the IDR plan there. You want to either see SAVE or PAYE or ICR, whatever it, it may be, there's four of them, um, and, and then whatever the payment is before you start making your payments. If you see the word LEVEL, that's an indication that you're in one of the standard or traditional plans that may or may not count towards forgiveness. It also may be a payment that you can't afford to make. So if that persists for a long period of time, you want to get onto your servicer immediately. Call them up and say, hey, we're, what's going on with my IDR application? You want to make sure that you're in the right, um, the right repayment plan and that you, you're, you're making the payment that, is, that you can afford to make. And I'm going to chime in, like, I think one of the common mistakes that we as borrowers, and again, I'm going to include myself as a former borrower, is you submit an application and then you think it's just taking them time and you don't follow up because the wait times are very long right now, especially uh, with return to repayment. Do not do that. You must be proactive. If you don't hear, I want to say within two to three weeks at most after you've submitted something, it can be just an acknowledgement of we got it. Assume that it got lost. Assume that your application was attached to an electronic shredder and it went nowhere. You must follow up because that's the number one mistake. The other thing to remember about the 12 month on ramp, the on ramp, what it's doing is if you don't make a payment, um, the federal government is not reporting those non-payments as a delinquent and you're not going to be reported as being in default. However, the credit bureaus may be marking non-payments on your credit report and that might have a, a soft impact, maybe not as harmful as a delinquency or default. Borrowers are still getting laid uh, invoices, past due invoices. And technically, every quarter, every third month that you don't pay, it should um, the servicer should automatically go back and give you a forbearance apply to your account. Um, the takeaway there is be aware that the on ramp may impact a little bit your credit, but more importantly, as Nancy mentioned, you should know whether you're eligible for a good repayment plan right now, and we do foresee that safe may be an affordable repayment plan. A lot of borrowers come to us and say, well, I'm an employee, I don't have any money, so why should I even get on a repayment plan? Your repayment plan amount, the amount you have to pay may be as little as zero. So the benefit of enrolling in a repayment plan based on your income, if you're unemployed especially or you don't have any income, is you have your loans in good standing, your required payment is zero, and you're accumulating credit 
Taurus eventual forgiveness. So why miss on that? Yeah. And then on save, which we didn't talk about, but I want to highlight the reason why all these states are suing to prevent save from continuing to be implemented, aside from like the forgiveness component, save is really important because it addresses interest. So in the past, if your required payment was zero, uh, you would be accumulating interest and for a lot of borrowers that would feel defeating because your loan balance would just keep on growing despite not being required to pay much or zero, right? With save, if you're enrolled in save, if your monthly payment doesn't cover the interest, the government is going to write it off. And that's really good because at least while you're experiencing some type of financial hardship, you have your loans in good standing and you're not accumulating interest. But that, by the way, doesn't mean that if you're pursuing IDR forgiveness after 2025, that you won't be taxed if you get forgiveness. It just means that the taxable balance will be less. So it's the the the, the savings or the, the the additional funds that these states feel like they they may be getting. Um, if you just pile interest on top of that, it's probably not as big as they think it, it would be anyway. It's just, yeah. and also there are ways of mitigating those those um, those tax obligations, depending on your situation. If your liabilities exceed your assets at the time, you may be able to mitigate some or all of those tax obligations, which would apply to a lot of borrowers regardless. So. And I think one final thought um, on what borrowers should do is file complaints. I mean, there's a lot of states that have student loan ombuds. New York is one of them. California. Uh, you can Google this. Um, file complaints with your state agency. Sometimes attorney general offices are also uh, keeping a pulse on those complaints. You can file a complaint with federal student aid. It, you, literally, you can Google federal student aid complaint. The reason why you want to file complaints if your servicers are not responding or giving you wrong information is because that's the best way to alert all this key key oversight players into the issues, right? They may hear about the issue weeks later when in fact, if people complain about it, they may be able to address the issues more systematically and more timely. Uh, I I will say I would be one of those people that will file a complaint even if I feel that I'm not gonna get the outcome that I'm expecting or get it resolved immediately because at least I have paper trail, right? If down the line I'm trying to fix my issue that was uh, made not because of my fault, I can then say, look, I filed a complaint. I tried to resolve my issue and couldn't get a favorable outcome then and that's why I should be entitled for X, Y, and Z relief. Gotcha. Moving on to a very timely topic, uh, taxes, which has been discussed in a few different ways already. Uh, but the deadline to file your taxes from last year is fast approaching on Monday, April 15th. Um, is there any last minute advice for student loan borrowers who are filing their taxes this year? Yes. Yeah, so for all of those that procrastinate, um, such as myself, because I only filed mine about a week ago. <laughs> um, so I know that you're out there. Um, a lot of this pertains to married borrowers. So if you are a, a, a married student loan borrower, um, one of the key considerations uh, in terms of, of making sure that you have like the right repayment plan is how do you file your taxes? So if you're married and you file your taxes jointly, your payment is going to be based on the combined income of you and your spouse. You do have the option now in all of the repayment plans, if you file your taxes separately, the payment will be based on your income alone. Um, and you always, you know, it, this is going to be an individual decision. We can't give you sort of a blanket solution um, because everybody's situation is going to be a little bit different. And generally speaking, if you file taxes jointly, there's some kind of a tax benefit to doing that. Um, but you want to make sure that you've explored the options. So um, you can determine what your, what kind of savings you might get by filing your taxes uh, separately from a perspective of the student loan payments by looking at either going to certain uh, student loan calculators that may be available on online, like the EDCAP calculator, or federal student aid has their student loan sim um, uh, simulator, simulator um, which can give you an idea of how much you'd be paying. Uh, you want to compare that to what it would cost you if you filed your taxes jointly figure out what the savings is and then compare that to what your the impact on your taxes would be by going to an accountant. We just want you to make an informed decision 
um, because you have this sort of short period of time now, if you haven't filed yet, to determine whether or not you're going to file your taxes jointly or separately, um, because the next time you go to recertify or apply for an IDR plan, it would be based on that decision. And another quick tip on this is, um, you know, if, if, if there is a big discrepancy between spouses in their earnings, like the spouse with the student loans makes very little versus the spouse uh, with no student loans uh, making a lot more, that's when logically yeah. it may very well make sense for you to file separately. Now, I want to point out, which is an issue we've been seeing in cases where both spouses have student loans there is kind of like a second level of review if you file jointly they should and when i say they the servicer in their calculation of your repayment plan should consider the total debt of both parties to give you um each spouse their corresponding uh, monthly payment that again accounts not only on your joint income but accounts for both of your loan balances and we've been hearing from clients that that second level of review is not happening that that ha I mean I can attest to this directly that 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 level of review has not happened at least with a couple of my clients um, so you want to know what you're supposed to be getting um, again, you can use these loan, certainly the federal student aid uh, loan simulator to kind of determine what your payment should be um, if you are married filing jointly and your spouse has federal student debt. Um, and once you get the actual number back from the servicer, if it doesn't match, that's when you have to go and, and call them up and, and, and just make them manually fix it. Um, but basically what they do is if you file your taxes jointly and you're married and both people have debt, they would calculate one payment based on your combined income and then they allocate it to each of you based on the respective debt sizes. So if we were married and I had 50% of the, uh, the debt and you had 50% of the debt, they would calculate one payment on our, our uh, combined income. I would be responsible for half of it, you would be responsible for the other half. So that's... And another thing to know, this is not only for Mary borrowers or people trying to figure out uh, how to file. Uh, if you're applying for an income-driven repayment plan, that's when this information becomes relevant. They're using your previous years, up to the last two years of taxes filed. If you already did your 2023, they would arguably be using your 2023 taxes. The issue that sometimes borrowers have is like, well, I plan to file separately 2024. Mm -hmm. Well, that's going to be hard to prove to the government that that's your intent. Right. Not saying you cannot do it. You might have to reach out to the servicer and provide, I don't know what they may and want. And they may do it or they may not do it. Yeah. I've seen that and I, I, don't, I don't think they're obligated to do that, to, to accommodate that. So Right. I, um, unless like, God forbid, a spouse dies, you become a widow, you might be able to provide some proof or, or, that your income has significantly decreased. Or if you separate. If, if you, you officially separate. separate from your spouse, you can then have the payment recalculated to be based on your income alone. So there are ways, and not to say that there are not ways. And we do have an entire blog on our website that it goes over tax filing considerations for borrowers because, again, we can probably spend an entire podcast just on that topic. <laughs> Definitely. All right, this is our last question. Um, EDCAP started in 2019. Can you tell us a little bit about the program and what changes you've seen in the student loan system and with the program itself over the past five years? So EDCAP, Education Debt Consumer Assistance Program, is a program of the Community Service Society of New York. And not a lot of people may be familiar outside of New York City with our agency, which is a nonprofit organization. We've been around, I want to say, for over 180 years. So we've been here for a while. And uh, we had seen through another program that a lot of people seeking general financial coaching advice had student loans. And so my agency decided that they were going to contribute to try to address this issue and launch EDCAP in 2019 with the sole purpose of having um, 
unbiased advice for anyone in New York uh, who has higher education debt, whether it's federal loans, private loans, or direct to school debt. And so the idea behind it is we have the ability to provide one-on-one -on -one direct consumer assistance focused solely and exclusively on higher education debt. So in 2019, we started the program. I I was hired to start the program. My colleague Nancy came came along with me shortly after, and then COVID hit. Uh, but COVID was a silver lining for us because it allowed us to go remote. And that was really critical because now we continue to operate uh, primarily remotely, although we offer in-person assistance. So from that time to now, we were able to be now fully funded by New York State. Uh, and we've been very successful. We want to say we're the first in the nation program that focuses on providing this direct consumer assistance to borrowers. Again, our focus is New York State because we are funded. Um, by New York State. Uh, what has been the changes since 2019? I can tell you that in 2019, when clients were coming to us for assistance, we only had bad news, right? It was like, I'm sorry, if you're pursuing PSLF and you consolidate, you're going to have to start over. Uh, we were seeing a lot of cases of people who, who were in default and were seeing their social security tax, um, their social security retirement, I'm sorry, be intercepted, wage garnishment. Like that was the bulk of our casework. And I... I am not like giving a plug here necessarily, but this administration really allowed us to provide so much more hope and actual relief to bars that in the last three, four years, we, we've been inundated. One, um, clients are now looking for help, um, especially with the resumption of payments. And the best part is that we can provide them options, right? Whether it's through SAVE, PSLF, income-driven repayment, forgiveness all these amazing programs that are now actually working so um i want to say it's uh night and day uh with the current administration and that's why uh, fingers crossed in terms of us being able to continue to provide relief uh we're going to be there for bars as as things change mm -hmm. because that's what we're here to do um and we're hoping that we we have an administration that continues the good work because it has literally changed lives Nancy can chime in and say that our clients literally come to us with tears once they find out that they no longer have this debt. And to put it into context, because I think student debt forgiveness is often controversial, uh, people who are getting relief have been trying to repay their student loans for decades. Uh, I want to say thir three to four decades at times, and many of them haven't, So, uh, and not because they don't want to. It's just the odds are against them for so many different reasons. And let's remember, life sometimes happens, right? We were supposed to benefit from getting a college degree. Well, higher education is not paying what it should in comparison to the cost. So there's a lot of barriers that are outside the hands of borrowers. And for us to be able to help them out and tackle this debt means that it's good for the economy. It's good for New York because then people can use that money to maybe buy a house. Uh, a car or save for their kids' college education. And, you know, it's not just about eliminating people's debts uh, it, because not every client that comes to us is in a position where we can eliminate their debt. But one of the other things that we get constant feedback on is this general sense of relief that they have a means of managing their debt. Like they understand it because we're going to sit there and take the time. It's not going to be a, a five-minute conversation with a loan servicer that's not really set up to do that kind of thing. It's going to be initially an hour-long conversation. It could be many subsequent hour-long conversations or, or meetings to get them where they need to be, but they to give them a full understanding of the, the system and the ability to navigate the system, hopefully on their own going forward. Um, but we get a lot of feedback, really positive feedback just for that. Like, I get it now. I know that it's, it's a weight off their shoulder, even if they still have the debt. They know that there's a way to, to manage it going forward. And I can't express how unique this program is uh, around the country. And hopefully, you know, more states will adopt a model like this going forward um, because it's really, really uh, needed. And, and I want to say this is my, my tagline whenever I'm doing presentations or talking about uh, what we do. Um, our clients range from judges 
to people in transitional housing, homeless shelters, right? And that tells you how complicated this system yeah, is. They're all equally confused. If we it. have, and everything in between, a lot of attorneys, uh, yep. everything in between teachers, Lots government teachers. employees. Yep. Um, if a judge has to come to me to understand how public service loan forgiveness works, and that means that that system is really complicated or understand the repayment options. These are people that can read a lot. They can understand the law. But one of the big benefits of our program is that this is all we do. So not only do we understand the rules as they're being uh, thrown at us uh, with ever changes, but from a pragmatic sense, we know how they're being implemented. We know the tips and tricks to make sure that an application gets processed, that we correct any errors or we prevent errors from happening. So I think that's the uh, added value of EdCab that we know the rules and we know how things are working and we can um, help the client navigate yeah. the system. We don't have like, we just meet with you once and that's it. Nancy mentioned the initial session. That's just for us to gather information and start strategizing. strategizing. Are you gonna repay this debt? Are you gonna pursue a forgiveness program? Or sadly enough, in some cases, are you just gonna pay this in the lowest repayment plan until you die? Because you're 75, 80 and it's gonna take you 30 years to pay this off. Let's not torture you. Let's be realistic in what's going to be your strategy. Definitely. Yeah, it was such a complicated system. It's it's uh, really, really helpful to have guidance like this, uh, expertise that be is much needed. Between the size of the, the problem, the size of the debt, and the, comp and the, the complexity of the system, uh, you almost have to ask your question, how do you get along without a program like this? Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's difficult. Yeah. It's difficult. Well, thank you both. Uh, for, for joining us today and all of your time. Um, thank you, Carolina. Thank you, Nancy. And thank you to our listeners. Um, until next time. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. EdCap is a program of the Community Service Society of New York, which has worked with and for New Yorkers since 1843 to promote economic opportunity and champion an equitable city and state.